Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Jesus told his disciples this parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out at dawn to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with them for the usual daily wage, he sent them into the vineyard. Going out about nine o'clock, the landowner saw others standing idle in the marketplace and said to them, you too, go into my vineyard and I will give you what is just. So they went off. And he went out again around noon and around three o'clock and did likewise. Going out about five o'clock, the landowner found others standing around and said to them, why do you stand here idle all day? They answered, because no one has hired us. He said to them, you two go into my vineyard. When it was evening, the owner of the vineyard said to the foreman, summon the laborers and give them their pay, beginning with the last and ending with the first. When those who had started about five o'clock came, each received the usual daily wage. So when the first came, they thought that they would receive more, but each of them also got the usual daily wage. And on receiving it, they grumbled against the landowner, saying, these last ones worked only for one hour, and you have made them equal to us, who bore the day's burden and the heat. He said to one of them in reply, My friend, I am not cheating you. Did you not agree with me for the usual daily wage? Take what is yours and go. What if I wish to give this last one the same as you? Or am I not free to do what I wish with my own money? Are you envious because I am generous? Thus the last will be first, and the first will be last. The Gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. I guess one approach to the scriptures is take each reading and reflect on it. And if we had that opportunity today or any time we prepare ourselves for the liturgy of the word and read the readings, any one of these readings could take us to the heights of relationship with God. I think they're just so beautiful. Isaiah uh, talking to the people in his book of consolation, talking to the people of Israel who are going back home and have no temple and, and assuring them that what you need to do now is have an ethical and moral life. Seek the Lord where he may be found. Find God in your life. And then turn away from wickedness. Do what is right. And realize, even though there's no temple, uh, you can find God where you are. Uh, don't forget, the reason there was no temple, it was destroyed. And... Don't think that God can be segmented into your way of thinking. God, through Isaiah, my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor your ways my ways, says the Lord. And boy, doesn't that reflect in the gospel today, God's ways through Jesus Christ. Um, I know what it felt like um, doing what those laborers do. Not recently. When I was in college, I would, I think they used to call it shape up in, the, in the, the hall. And that meant that you woke up early, which I despise greatly, woke up early, put on, you know, workman's shoes and jeans and gloves and all that stuff, and went around the corner in Jersey City, where I lived, and, and sat there until some construction company said, okay, you, 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 come on in and work for the day. And some people didn't get chosen. And, of course, those who didn't get chosen had to go home and maybe come the next day or seek out another job. It was a part-time job for me, so you know, I sort of had a mixed blessing when I wasn't chosen. I went back home and went to sleep. But then told me, well, they didn't, they didn't need me today, you know. Uh, when I find, and this has nothing to do with the gospel, I have, I have to put this little PS in there. When I finally did get a job, it was through people, this was Jersey City, and everybody knows everybody in Jersey City, and it was through people I knew, and as a matter of fact, I, his name was Vince, and he was like a gumad. He was my, my mother's gumad's husband, and, you know, everybody knows everybody. And Vince said, Louie, I saw you in the hall. What were you doing in the hall? I said, well, Vince, I was looking for a job for the summer. Ah, oh, you, you come. Tomorrow, you start. Come, just come to me, and I'll 
and he picked me up at the house, brought me coffee. Hmm. Yeah, I, was in the, I was in the college. I was in Seton Hall University. You know, maybe someday this guy will be a priest. I guess he was hedging his bet. No, he was a wonderful guy. Anyway, brought me coffee, brought me bagels, took me to the field. And we built a huge complex in Jersey City. It's, it's the, the, uh, it's the uh, Port Authority building, I think, in Jersey City now. And, and I was there in the early stages of it. Wow. And didn't raise a finger. Um, I would go in, and the first job, with my brand new boots and my brand new gloves, brand new jeans, brand new shirt, you know, ready to work. First job was to take the coffee order for all the guys. So I would, I would go through the entire field and take the coffee order, and then go buy the coffee, and then bring back the coffee, and then had the coffee, okay? So this brought us to like 11.30, and then they'd say, okay, um, start getting ready um, because it's, it's lunchtime. And I'd, you know, close this box, close that, close that, that box, and we're off to lunch with the guys. And came back from lunch, and not everybody did this, and I'm not saying it's, it's acceptable practice in the unions, and not, you know, I'm just saying in my little world, that's what happened. Um, and would, it would be lunchtime. And we had lunchtime, come back, two or three o'clock, and then one day someone, I can't say his name, someone said, you know, I have a special project for you. Okay, this has nothing to do with the gospel. I'm just telling you a story, you know. <laughs> I have a special project for you. And he handed me, oh God, I hope no one, uh, uh, there'll be no name to this because I think it was illegal. Uh, he handed me a how to drive a motorcycle book. I didn't drive a motorcycle. How to ride a motorcycle, I didn't ride a motorcycle. But it was how to take the test to pass the motorcycle exam. So I took it, I read it, I studied it, you know, I could read, you know. And a few days later, I went to take the test and they gave me the permit. And someone's out there driving a motorcycle <laughs> on my license. So that was my big job. Okay, now, now not everybody in the labor unions um, operate that way. And labor today has a, a you know, mixed blessing name. I mean, and thank God for Verum Novarum, our, our Pope Leo the, the 13th, uh, appreciation for the union, uh, appreciation for the laborer, and, and of course, some parts of this gospel even, even are reminiscent of, of the immigrants who are here in our country seeking employment. And, and sometimes you have to see them standing in certain locations looking for employment. So the dignity of the worker is, is very sacred for Christ, for the church, and for our scriptures. But that's not what the scriptures are about today. This is a parable that Jesus is telling us. And what is a parable? A parable is a concise story that is drawn from life which, when told in a particular audience, makes one point. And that point usually challenges the accepted views. Okay, and that's what Jesus is talking about. The kingdom of heaven is like this landowner. And he goes out. He goes out more than once. He goes out five times. And just put yourself in the sandals of the workers. You know, you're there looking for a job. Oh, good, you, he wants you? Good, I'm, I'm going into the vineyard and working. And he goes out five times until he goes out like five o'clock and the last, last pay time is six o'clock. And that last character who worked an hour gets as much of a salary as the guy who worked all day. And there's grumbling. My grandmother used to say, manji loki. Jealousy eats people's eyes out. And, and it's interesting because when Paul, uh, when, when Jesus told the story and, and was recorded in, in Matthew's gospel, the, the, the word envious, are you envious because I am generous, is what the landowner says to the, those who grumble. It's the green-eyed monster. You know, why should he be blessed? Look all I do. Look, look what I do in my life. Look what I do in my family. Look how often I go to church. And why should he be blessed just like I'm blessed? One of, death, death confessions, death, dead confessions are very popular in the church, very famous in the church. One of the greatest ones is, is Constantine, Augustine, but a whole bunch of wonderful people who re, repented and, and made deathbed confessions and were brought into heaven. After living a, a, a life that was miserable, they went to heaven, we presume. Because they were forgiven and brought... That's God's business. That's God's business. In our own lives, are we envious of those... We go to church, we do all the right things, but then there are those who get blessings. And, and I'm, not, I'm not talking earthly blessings, because I, I don't think earthly blessings 
wealth and, and big homes and cars are, are a sign of blessing. That's a sign of labor. And some people are lucky in labor and some, some people are advantageous in labor and some people are at the right spot at the right moment. I mean blessings. I mean confidence is that, that God is with you. And to know that you can go through anything in life to know that God is with you. And maybe some of us who go to church all the time and do all the right things maybe even lack that appreciation that God can grant his generous mercy and blessings and grace to anyone who turns his way. How often we've seen you know, famous people, uh, sports characters, even politicians who have you know, terrible lives and, and convert, find God, find Christ find the scriptures, and then go on a circuit and preaching and go to colleges and go to uh, schools and talking about their conversion experience and, and, and how God has affected them in their lives. And, and the rest of us might sit back and say, hey, listen, I've been doing this all my life. I'm not on a college circuit. No one's paying me to, to share my life. I've been doing this all my life. He, he, he just came in under the wire, maybe because he was near death's door or, or, or on the bottom of his, his, his life cycle a ladder of life and, and woke up and he found God and he's making it yes and he's making it God and that's what the gospel is about it's, it's about the generosity of not the owner of the vineyard the kingdom of heaven is like make sure we realize that Jesus is talking about his father and how his father can grant mercy and, and an author early 20th century Theologian uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer referred to this kind of last-minute grace as, as cheap grace. You know, like, he didn't really earn it. Like, we are earning our gra great. What's grace? I'll tell you what Maurice Duchesne said. Maurice Duchesne was my spiritual di uh, director in the seminary. He's a wonderful priest. He's deceased now. Wonderful, wonderful priest. I mean, holy is... Is all outdoors and just, just, just wonderful and real. He was an artist. He was a theologian, and and one day I said to him, "What is grace?" And he said, "You know what grace is." He says, "You're an artist. When you sit down at the palette or, or play with your clay, what inspires you? That's grace." My art at that time it really still is very spiritual, not religious always, but very spiritual. And he said, "That's grace." God's life within you is grace. Forcing you, encouraging you to do what's right, to, to bring more of his word, his life to others. And, and it, it's not, I don't corner the market. We all have God's grace. From the moment of baptism to, to the moment of death, we have God's grace. His, his vi vital life living within us. And if it's cheap grace that we earn only on our deathbed or only by doing one good deed in our lives, eh, it's God's grace. And you're going to complain that God is, is, is giving grace and love and, and generosity to one person over another? That's not our role. Our role is to be people, and, and, and Paul says it so well, my God, to be consumed by Christ. Now, it sounds like a little neurotic. It sounds a little, come on, what are you, uh, charismatic? Not that, not that there's anything wrong with being charismatic. But, you know, you're over the top, being consumed by Christ. No, we can be consumed by Christ living our daily lives. We don't have to be preachers. We don't have to be televangelists. We don't have to be superstars to be consumed by Christ. We have to be people who have Christ when we're cooking, when we're sleeping, when we're making love. We have to be people who have Christ in our lives when we're going through struggles, when we're going through accomplishments, when we're going to visitations. We have Christ in our lives. And we know constantly by reflection and prayer, if I'm a dentist and taking care of my patient, Christ is with me. If I'm, I'm a mortician and I'm... I'm preparing uh, the, the family for uh, the, the viewing of, of their deceased person, I have Christ in my life. But we have to constantly bring that grace in. It's there, but we have to activate it and act as if it is always with us. How dare us be, je be, be jealous of somebody else being more confident that God is in their life than, than I am confident in, in God being in my life. And Paul, Paul says it so well, as, as you heard from the commentary, uh, he was in prison this, this letter to the Philippians. It's sometimes called Paul's love letter because he loved the Philippian people. He had a special bond with them. And, and he says to them very, very simply and succinctly, Christ is magnified in my body, whether by life or by death. If I die, hey, I'm with Christ. If I live, and this is Paul's little uh, humble side, you benefit. 
You know, if I live, you benefit because I can share Christ with you. So, so, but he was happy to do that because he was consumed by Christ. He was in prison when he was doing this. He was in prison when he wrote this letter of joy of being consumed by Christ. He wasn't saying, what's my next meal? How am I going to get out of here? He did get out eventually. And eventually he was, he was uh, martyred in another situation in Rome. But it, the thoughts on, the, on his head, Christ in my life is my thought. And we need that when we're picking up our kids from school, when we're, we're bringing them to college. We, we need that when we're, when we're checking into our dorms for the first time, when we're at our first frat meeting. Christ is in my life. How do I act? What do I do? And the action of that prayer is increasing God's earned grace in our lives. And it's a challenge. It's there every day. And and it's up to us as as Christians to look at the scriptures and say, wow, I I don't need the the building the church to find Christ. God's ways are above your ways and way out of your league. Just be with God and he's there with you. Yes, we gather as Christians in the church. Why? Because this is our place of nourishment, our nurturing on the scriptures, our nurturing from his holy body and blood in the Eucharist. This is our community. This is where we get our energies to go out and live Christ and be consumed by Christ. So we need this, but the action starts out there. When I see my clients for the first time in, in family therapy, uh, the, the last stipulation on, on their in, intake chart, it's called informed consent, is the risks of therapy. And, and I always tell them the risks of therapy is the reason you're here has to change. Okay? People come to therapy not because they're doing well, you know, come to therapy to get well, to, to change. So the reason you're here has to change, and the change begins here, but really gets activated when you leave. Testing ourselves in the world. Is that unique? Paul, Christ, the scriptures have told us that for thousands of years. That we come together to to receive the Eucharist, but to activate it out there. And Paul knew that. Paul was very aware of that. I long to depart this life and be with Christ. That's what I really want. Yet, that I remain in the flesh is necessary for your benefit. So in the meantime, let us all conduct ourselves according to the gospel and worthiness of the gospel of Christ. There are so many aspects of the scriptures today that, that really appeal to us and, and encourage us to be disciples, to, to be people who live it. And the fact that the, the man, the owner of the vineyard, went out more than once, shows us that the parable we heard is, is not a union contract. The parable we heard was about justice, ge- but generosity even more than justice. The parable we heard was not about money, but it was about salvation. The parable we heard was not about comparisons, but a relationship with God. And we need to serve God in people we meet. Sometime last year, at the chapel where I used to serve, um, one of the students came to me here at Mass and said, Father Louis, he said, I was very upset with what the priest said to me after Mass this last Sunday. Said, what was that? He said, it's your fault that, that kids aren't coming down to Mass. It's your fault that, that people, young people aren't at, at, at the chapel. And, and the kid said, he said, I told him, Father, he says, I'm only the club president. He said, Matt and Father Lou were on campus every day. They went to the fraternity parties and meetings. They, they hung out with the, with the different clubs. They went to every event. And people knew them, and they brought people down that way. And he says, oh, no, 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 no. This was his response. And God bless him, but misguided. He was from Poland. Nothing against Polish, but he said, well, in Poland, all we do is open the doors of the church, and the people come in. Jesus in the scriptures today says even the vineyard owner went out five times and he wasn't selective. No, no, no. Who was there, he brought in. See how the scriptures speak to us? 
We need to be on guard all the time. You don't know where the next person that you need to bring to church is. He or she could be in your office. He could be your neighbor. He could be on campus with you. But you need to be there. And we as priests are obligated by, to be there. And that's what my ministry and Matt's ministry and many campus ministries throughout the country's ministry is. To be there. To meet them where they are. To hang out with them and invite them. What happened to the vineyard? They were all invited. And he didn't say, oh no. Like, often. How many times I used to hear this on campus. Oh no, Father Lou, you don't want me to come to church because if I came to church, the, the ceiling would fall in. My response to that is, hey, listen, it hasn't fallen in. Fallen, well, I don't know what the grammar is. It hasn't fallen in. All the years I'm here, it's not going to fall in because you come in. We need to welcome one another. We need to welcome that person down the block who seems a little angry or upset. Hey, Come, pray with us. Come, see what it's all about. We need to do that with our classmates, with our neighbors, with our children, with our parents. That's what the vineyard is all about. Because the vineyard is not about the vineyard. The vineyard is about heaven. And it's about amazing grace. 